Okay, so on your map, go to where temperature is. I'm going to use just this area. So this will be your last question, the last essay question. So you've actually covered four essay questions right now, or, or three essay questions right now. I'm going to give you the fourth one. I'm not hiding anything from you. I never do. I'm just like, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make two graphs. Uh, work. Two graphs. And I want you to explain, I want you to see something. You've actually already answered it um, earlier. One, two. We're going to label this one humans. Right on the T, the text box for T on your thinking map. You have plenty of room in there. Remember, you were supposed to write in there the, the importance of temperature. I am not filling out your, your map. That those are your notes. That's the one thing you will not turn in. That is all your learning that you're taking out of this unit. Okay. So again, if you have extra stuff you want to add in there that you think that you could use, yeah. Since I don't have mine and I'm copying it, uh, that means should I write on hers? So she can have the notes too. Yes, that'd be great. That'd be great. And then take a picture. Okay. All right. So on the y-axis, we're going to do this percent um, effectiveness. Now this y-axis is going to go for both graphs. Percent effectiveness of enzymes. So basically, how well are the enzymes going to work? At what percentage? Zero to 100 percent. On the x-axis, we're going to do temperature. So we have temp on both sides. label the other graph in a moment. You also do one other thing. Enzyme graphs. There's like graphs for enzymes and graphs for this and graphs for bacterial growth and graphs. There's standard curves that they have. For enzymes, you have this type of curve. So we'll end up doing the same on both. So I want you to listen and pay attention as we're going through this because it's making one big connection. optimal temperature for us? 98.6. Okay, so we're going to make a marker here saying at this point, you got 98.6, and if I were to draw a little, this is where you'd be 100% effective. 100% effective. Who's had a really high fever before? 103? Keep your hand up if you're still in this. 103, 104, 105, 106, Marshall, 107, 107, Beatrice, and 107 is about where you can top out at. And when you start getting high fever, has anybody had to get the high fever and they throw you in the shower and they're like, you got to get cooled off? Who's had that happen before? you got to get cooled off. Because remember, your enzymes are what make that uh, um, aerobic cellular respiration process happen. <laughs> what happens if we stop or screw up that process? You die. You die. You die. Your cells die and everything starts breaking down. That's why they said your brain will start dying, your brain will start deteriorating, it's bad for your brain. Whatever they say, basically it's because your enzymes, the shape of your enzymes change enough that aerobic cellular respiration won't continue and therefore energy goes down. So watch. We're going to go here. Uh, we're going to put a mark here, right, along this curve. For that curve, we're going to say the top end of effectiveness. Now, we're not at 100% right here. What percentage are we at, or about? What percentage about are we at right here? About 50%. We're about 50% effective this. So at, at when you said yesterday, and it was so cool when I went to each one of you guys, and I'm like, hey, when you have a fever, you feel sick. Why is it that you're really weak? And you're like, when well, enzymes not working, we're not making ATP. And I'm like, high five, high five, high five. That was awesome. That's really good. Um, and that's because you're still making ATP. You're just making it really slow. And you're not doing it very good, OK? 107 is about as high as you can go. Past that. This drops off so much that you're not making enough energy, you die. It's, that it's not sustainable. Yeah. yeah, that's why they when they when they when you get that high, they will start packing you with ice. They'll start doing whatever they can to get control of the fever. They'll start giving you different medications to get control of the fever. And I want you to do one more thing too to think about this. And this isn't really related to what we're saying, but I want you to be proud of yourself because we have five different biology classes going on right now. Okay, there's five different teachers. 
four of them are teaching fifth hour alone, okay? There's a lot of different teachers that are going on. Every single one of them, you might say, and I, who knows somebody in a different biology class, right? And I know you guys talk and you guys compare stuff. Make yourself feel smart. Go up to them. All of them have already covered their wants already. You need water, okay? I want you guys to go up to them and go, what do you need water for? What are they going to say? To stay hydrated. Why? To stay alive. I guarantee none of them know what you know. You came in this class already knowing that. I want you to leave knowing more than you before. Everybody likes to learn. It's just work, and nobody likes to do work. We're inherently lazy. Be proud of yourself. Go on and go, what do you need temperature for? So I stay comfortable. Gosh, really? Really? That's what you got out of your 10th grade, second to last, third to last high school class, you know, science-wise. That's what you got out of it. You already knew that in second grade. You're learning something kind of cool here, okay? Now, I want to show you one more thing on the low end, okay? Um, how low do you think we can go on this, like, temperature, core body temperature? What do you think the lowest core body temperature you can actually go? Give me some numbers. 92. 92 I got. What? What else? 50. What else? 90. 90. 70. 87. 87. 82. 60. 62. What else? What else? 82. 82. Any other guesses? That's good? Okay. Watch. There's a show called Man vs. Wild. If you get a chance. Love it. Love it. Bear Girls is awesome. Who who has not seen Man vs. Wild? And before all you haters start getting out there, just calm down for a minute. Oh, yeah. What? Ah, shh. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Okay. It's a great show. There's haters out there. Who has not seen it again? You gotta see it. You gotta see it, guys. It's so good. Is it not good? It's a fan. It is entertaining as all get. I don't actually think they're making new episodes of that. He's got a different show. No, Bear Grylls. Bear Grylls is a man about man. Okay, I'm just. Gonna, I would. Yeah, he he's a beast. He was a special forces guy in the British Army. Um, he knows all the stuff. He's got the accent. So he's like basically everything. He's got you know those like British uh, colloquial colloquialisms, the, the words that they use for everything. So he calls vitamins vitamins. So he's like, you need to get yourself some vitamins and a bit of protein. And then you put them in your rucksack. Okay, so everything's got like words for like all these different things. So he goes along and talking. And then essentially the premise of the show, I didn't realize, that's a lot of you. It's kind of an older show, I guess. The, the premise, you've seen it, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. The premise of it is, if you get dumped out, it's one of those survival shows. If you get dumped in the middle of wherever, how are you going to survive? And usually he's out for seven days. They usually helicopter him in. And it's kind of funny because he kind of plays the camera a little bit. Like he, they'll open the scene. He's standing on the skid, the sled of a, of a helicopter, and he's like, we're over Borneo right now. If you ever get stuck in Borneo, you need to know how to survive. And then he does a backflip <laughs> off of it. And he's like, woo! It's like a circus. It's awesome, right? And he parachutes in and all sorts of stuff. But every time he gets in it, he takes it to the nth degree. This is why people hate it, because they're like, oh, it's fake. Oh, it's fake. It's fake. He has a camera crew there. He always does. It makes it seem like there's, it's just by himself. I mean, that's how it's shot. But he does have a camera crew there. He does have safety guys there. Because I can say, tell you this, as a producer of this show, I'd be like, you're worth millions of dollars, you're not going to get killed. Okay? Because if you get killed, we're going to get sued and all this other stuff. So they let him take risks and let him do stuff to a certain extent, but they kind of try stuff out. But nonetheless, the stuff he does on the show, when you watch it, you're just like, whoa, whoa. But I will tell you this, those of you guys who hates the cold, we have, I, you see some of the stuff that he does on there with the cold, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He'll get into different settings. <clears throat> The best ones, and I was going to try and download the clip last hour, I just never, I run out of time all the time. And I go, uh, he was in a, a desert situation, and he's like, in a desert su situation, and you need to survive, you need to get water. Like, he goes on this thing, he's walking along, ready? Those of you guys who haven't seen it, you'll be like, oh my gosh. And this is, don't ruin it, don't ruin it if you've seen it. He finds the freshest pile of elephant poo, this giant pile, okay? And he says, in any situation, you can get water if you just look hard enough. He takes this big plug of elephant poo, holds it over his head, squeezes it out like a sponge, and all the liquid that comes out, he's just like, ah, just drinking it like that crazy. And you're just like, ooh, 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 ooh. okay, that's real, okay? I, whatever else he does, that's fine, I'll take it. He did another one where he found he was going along the desert. Some of them you can tell are a little bit set up, but like there's another one, there's a dead camel right there. He's like, you're in a survival situation. You gotta survive. You know, he's like that. He cuts open the camel, yeah. cuts into his stomach, pulls the contents of the out, 
sponges it out again to drink out of it, and then takes it a step further and does the Star Wars thing. <laughs> he sleeps inside the carcass for the nighttime. Okay, he slept in the You're like, whoa. Okay, that's crazy. If you ever get a chance, watch them. There's so many clips on there, you're like, that's amazing. I've seen him jump into this ice cold water. They're like, he's like, if you have a fall through the ice in the lake and you need to get out, like, who does this? Okay, but whatever, you're still entertaining nonetheless. The other thing he does too, which always cracks me up, he's naked, like, like gratuitously naked, like too much, right? And they pixelate it out, but it's still funny to watch because he'll be naked down to his boots. So he's running along, you know, like that. Boots are on, nothing else, and he's got his rucksack on, and you just gotta real realize, there's all these guys that are just there with him. And he's like, whatever, he's going on, right? So this one time, this one scene that he had, this is the one that kind of drew to me. I was like, dang, that is cool. Because one of the things they always talk about in all these survival things is hypothermia, <coughs> hypothermia. you got to be careful because hypothermia sits in. You only have a matter of minutes to survive and all this other stuff. And you're like, what is that? You know, And it's about how cold your body, your core body temperature gets so that your enzymes aren't affected and you don't tweak them too much such that that aerobic cellular respiration pace slows all the way down. So he comes up on this river, it's flowing, but there's ice everywhere. There's snow and ice everywhere. And if you've seen this, don't get it away. He comes up and he's like, if you're in a survival, a survival situation, and he's like, you need dry clothes, you need all this, and you stay warm. So he strips all his clothes off, leaves his boots on, puts them in his rucksack, tosses it across the river, and gets all the way across, just jumps in the river, man. Just jumps in, I'm like, oh, it's just ice water. He gets across, and he's like, First thing you gotta do is you gotta get your blood, to your cold temperature up. So he starts doing like jumping jacks and push-ups, and he's butt naked still with his boots on, right? So it's just entertaining to watch. You're like, where's this going? He does it. He starts to get a fire built, and his whole thing is your clothes will be dry, so you can put your clothes back on. You'll get warm and all that other stuff. But the, this is the crazy part. This is how cold it was, and this is why I'm like, wow. Yeah, no kidding. You gotta be like, if it's too cold, it's just too cold. He takes his boot off. It probably took three minutes for this to happen. He takes his boot off throws it aside, puts his clothes on, and is getting this stuff going. And he goes, look, this is how cold it was. He holds up his boot because his shoelaces had been undone. He holds up the boot, and the one shoelace that was kind of laying off on the ground, when he holds it up, the shoelace is frozen solid sticking straight up. And you're like, oh my gosh, that is freezing cold. And you were out there butt naked up to your, you know, and you're just freezing, okay? This is the weird thing. Your core body temperature, the lowest it can get, we'll put a mark here, all the guests on there, not bad, 95 degrees. That's the lowest in your core temperature, about 95 degrees. It, and that's the thing, perfect, I'm glad you said that. This difference right here, our bodies only have about 12 degrees to play with. Outside that 12 degree range, you're dead, all right? Now, do we fall outside of that very often? No, you burn through a lot of food every day to try and maintain this temperature. But this right here is what they call the comfort range. So you have this comfort range that you have to stay within if you get outside, outside of it. Um, what doesn't work if you're outside of that comfort range? Enzymes do not work, okay? Now, I'm going to show you the other side. Uh, and I know this deeper, it's like, we talk about snakes a lot. I'm like, I don't know, okay. I, I, it's kind of, I know some stuff and I have stories to go along with it. I always thought snakes liked like really warm temperature. And they do kind of, the whole thing, we get that stuck in our head because they're cold blooded so that they need to regulate their body temperature by the outside temperature. They actually like their optimal temperature, so if we're gonna put the little optimal temperature up there, 80 degrees is what they like. That's where they're good at. And what works best at that temperature for them? Their enzymes are working best at that, okay? Now, now let, listen real quick. Why is it that their optimal temperature is 80 degrees Ours is 98 degrees. Talk to your partner. You have 12, 30 seconds. Why? Ah, ah, don't just quietly. Why is it we have 98 degrees and they have 80 degrees? Talk to your partner. 20 seconds. Go. Sounds better. 
but it's not about being smaller. Lexi? They don't have as many? Not as, it's not about how many they have. You're super close. We talked about, hmm, it's, a, it's still about the enzymes. Beatrice, what do you think? What'd you guys come up with? Okay, I'll help you out, and then I'll give you a chance to talk. No, see if you can figure it out. Raise your hand when you figure it out. So, when this was intact, when this was intact, could I undo, raise your hand when you figure it out, could I undo a flathead screw with this, with this, uh, with this device, we'll say? Yes or no? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Could I also use a metal knife? Sure. Could I use a screwdriver? Sure. Could I use a coin? Figured out yet? Oh, say it louder. Didn't you guys tell me at the beginning? Oh, yeah, different tools. Different tools, man. Different tools, different tools, different enzymes, right? Snake's different than you, right? Are we okay? So watch this, and I'll go a little bit further. So I had a snake one time when I was a kid. I had, like, we had paper routes and stuff when we were kids. They haven't done that for a long time, and I made my own money and saved up all that stuff. My parents were pretty poor and stuff, so I would buy my own stuff. So I had this snake, and I'm like, snakes like it hot. They like it hot and stuff like that. So I took my snake, and it was in this tank. I put it outside in the tank, right, for like an hour or something like that. So I came back out later. Yeah, I was dead. It's so sad, too. And I was like, oh, because I spent the money on it. And, but it was doing this weird, like, like it made one last-ditch attempt to try and like, I don't know where it was going. I just remember it was kind of sticking up like this a little bit. It was just like that. Because I came out, I go, oh, he's, he's, he's bathing in the sun. He's so cute. Like, like that. And I'm like, hey, wake up. He was dead. I was like, oh, my gosh. Right? So they actually don't like it that hot. Most people think they do. Top end for them, about 120 degrees. If you get their core temperature up to 120 degrees, and they pass that, they're toast. So snakes will go out in the sun to get warmed up to try and get up to 80. If they start getting warmer, what do they do? They go somewhere else. They go get cool off, and they go back and forth. And that's what they spend a lot of their energy doing sometimes, just going back and forth, because they're cold-blooded. But it all revolves around this different enzyme thing. Now watch. So to see how different those enzymes are, watch. I had, uh, so I was uh, college, it was after Dr. Schuett's class. I was taking this class at the time. I was driving on to the Loop 101. I always forget, I think it's over here, Loop 101. There's a loop over here. I get all turned chain out. No, it's over here, I think. Yeah, is it that way? Oh, no, it's that way. Is that way? Okay, I get turned around here. I cannot get my north, south, east. I always feel like north is this way in here, just because of where I'm positioned. So this was like this is like 1997, a long time ago, where you guys were born type that stuff. And yeah, forever ago. And there wasn't the, the road wasn't complete yet. You know how the Skunk Creek Wash kind of runs parallel to it, stuff like that? There was still a lot of wildlife in there that we used to see half leaner running around in there. Like, we'd drive down, uh, the, going to Walmart. You know how 83rd Avenue goes up to Union Hills and goes to Walmart? You know how that bridge goes over the wash? It used to go down in it. And I had a friend of mine who hit a javelina probably 11 years ago doing it. It was before they put that bridge in. So there's a lot of wildlife that was out there, and there's still the wildlife that's there. I'm pulling on Loop 101, and there's a big gopher snake crawling on the road. There's another one that had already been hit. And it's just like some of you guys would like get out and if you see a cat or a dog or whatever, I feel just bad for them too. So hit the door. So I will take I will take the snake, I will retrieve it, and I'll throw it off the edge. But it was like May, and I knew that it was warm, and they were probably out looking for mates. So if I kind of threw it down there, I was just like, this is going to come back again anyways. But I didn't want to see it die. And I thought, I was like, oh, Dr. Shewitt in his classroom, you know the specimen jars that keep all the little dead animals in and stuff like that? You know, it was filled with alcohol or formalin or whatever. He had a whole like sh giant shelf full of these animals and stuff, and I remember going, oh, because it was a big giant, it was a big five footer, it was big, it was bigger than that one and thicker than two, and I go, oh, I'll take this and I'll get him a specimen, you know what I mean? I had a pickle jar at home, I thought I'll put it in the pickle jar, I'll fill it with alcohol, and I'm like, here you go, Doctor Shoot, here's a specimen for your collection. <laughs> Brown nosing, I know, it helped me get an A or whatever. I got an A in the class, you know, making connections, whatever. So I go, I'm gonna do that. I took him and I threw him in a backpack in the back of my car. Took him home. Wait, was he dead? No, he was alive. He was alive. He was alive. There one was hit, one wasn't. The one I was going to try and save, but the problem was I was afraid he was going to come back anyways. And I thought, oh, I know. You're trying to figure out, so what? how do you make him a specimen? And that's the thing. If you ask people, they go, so if you have a live snake, how do you, like, they use the words called dispatch. 
how do you dispatch that animal? How do you kill that animal? Okay. Some people are like, what do you do? So, how can you kill an animal? Yeah, stick it outside. That's a good one. Yeah, I, not, I didn't even think about that. That's actually not too bad. No, some people are like you could strangle it, ah, you know, or you can pin it in the head, like put a pin like in his brain. You can shoot it, you cut off his head. You're like, oh, well, all this stuff is like way crazy. Yeah. Slash, slash, it destroys a specimen. You know what I mean? The whole idea is to have something that's preserved, something you can look at later on. Okay. So this is ah. Okay. So watch. This is what you do. You can put it into a freezer. It'll get really cold. He'll cuddle up, he'll just curl, curl up, and then as his body temperature keeps dropping and dropping, then he goes to sleep, and then, yeah, he's dead. It works for chickens and puppies, too. It's the same thing. It works for what? I'm just what? joking with you, okay? <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just... Okay, okay, so listen. So I put him in there quickly. Okay, so I put him in the freezer, he, and I left him in there like five, six hours. It was one of those chest freezers. You know, you open the top up and drop it, so it's like just like deep. Toss him in there, and he was in a little bag and stuff. And then I, I came back five, six hours. It was a long time. I came back. I was like, tink, tink, tink. He's solid. Picked him up. It was like a big little, you know, snake pancake. He was just like that. I was like, tink, tink, tink. He's frozen, solid, dead. It was May, and I thought, okay, once I freeze him, I'll let it sit out in the sun a little bit. It'll warm up, defrost. Then I would put him back in there. So I had the jar full of alcohol. And as he started becoming more pliable and movable, then I just started putting him in there and feeding him in there. And he was kind of twisting around in there and twisting around and putting him in there and twisting around a little bit. And I put the top on. And it was still moving a little bit. And then I saw it. I was like, look, and I go, his tongue. And I went, oh, no snakey shot. No, I was like, don't die. Like, uh, but I, I was like. Oh my gosh, because he's in a vat full of alcohol. If I pull him out, he's going to be all jacked up, because his whole body's just submersed in rubbing alcohol. So I'm just like, oh, die. Oh, I can't watch this anymore. Oh. And so I left him in there. He eventually died, but I put him in that freezer for hours. He was like, he couldn't have been fully, fully frozen, because that would have burst, started bursting his cells when it crystallized and stuff like that. He had to have been really, really, really cold. I'm estimating that he had to have been somewhere down around 40 degrees. So the bottom end for a snake, core temperature is it can get down to 40 degrees. What's the comfort range on this? You have 80 degrees of play on there's comfort range. Why is it they have 80 degrees and we only have 12? Different tools. Different tools or different enzymes. Different enzymes. Crazy. Crazy. Now, I was going to actually get that. You guys figured a lot of that out by yourself. I was, if you want to, put different enzymes. Different enzymes on there so that you remember that. Okay? I have had people go like this. They go, it's because they're, listen carefully so that you don't make this mistake. I've had people go, it's because they're cold-blooded. Because this is one of the questions. I'll say this. Why is it that snakes have a bigger comfort range and we have a smaller comfort range? Or why is it that we have this or this? Um, at 40 degrees, how fast is a snake going to be moving? Very, very slow. Very slow if it's moving at all. And I'll say, why is it that humans are able to move around at 40 degrees? If it's 40 degrees outside, can we run around? Yeah. Okay? We can because we have a core body temperature and we're operating at that temperature. Snakes, they'll be moving really, really slow. So what's the big difference? Why do we have these different temperature ranges? Why do we have a list? What's all different? Enzymes. Different enzymes. People will say, no, it's because they're cold blood. I'm like, nah, that kind of has nothing to do with that. That goes back to a natural selection you think. So sometimes people go, hey, so it kind of sucks to be a snake. Kind of, <laughs> kind of not. Now watch. How much food do we spend on, our, on ourselves? A lot. a lot. Okay. Snakes, not that much. Okay. And what do the snakes do with their, most of their food? What are they invested in? What do they put it into? What do they do with it? Well, what do we do with most of our food? Breathe it out. And it's converted into what? And put your hand on your head. Heat. 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 Snakes don't make their own body heat. Okay. And they can put most of their energy into growth. So now some of you guys are like, that'd be sweet. I'd love to be huge. You know what I mean? I thought I'd eat 80,000 pounds of food, and then I'd be like 80,000 pound job of the hut sitting in this room. Right? <laughs> Come at me, bro. You know what I mean? Like that, right? But here is the benefit. Everything's got a trade off in nature. Everything's got a trade off in nature. So snakes have different enzymes than us. We got different enzymes. Um, they're cold-blooded. They can invest all this energy into growth. We have to invest it to keep maintaining this body temperature. 
But I'll tell you what, if I put, uh, see it, I'll put, uh, I'll put Andrew, Andrew and Corey. Put Andrew and Corey out in the parking lot right now, first thing in the morning. You're out there in your boxers, okay? It's freezing cold, right? Go out there. A couple weeks ago, remember how cold it was? Throw you out there, 40 degrees out there. I throw you guys out there, I throw the snake out there, right? So you tell me, do I still, would I still want to be a snake? Would I still want to be able to get all this investment and get huge versus maintaining a body temperature such that I can move? So you guys are out there, you're cold, but can you still move? Put the snake out there, right? How well is he moving? Not much. Not much. So if I put you guys out there and I come up to you guys and I'm like, tickle fight, tickle fight, tickle fight, tickle fight, what are you guys doing? What do, you, uh, what do I hope you're doing? Swinging. Or at least running, okay? What's the snake doing? Oh, my God. Creeper. You know, like that. Like that. There's when the benefit comes into play, okay? So remember this. There's that whole separate thing with, with cold blood and warm blood and all that other stuff. The bottom line is moving slow and why they do it and all that still comes back to enzymes and how well you process that, uh, that ATP and make that ATP happen. Kind of cool, huh? Okay. I think we're done with this one. Yes.